Undertale is a game that means a great deal to me personally, and equally speaking, one that needs absolutely no introduction. An indie smash hit by Homestuck music veteran Toby Fox, the game released in 2015 to deafening success, launching it into the starring role of its own eclectic, multifaceted fandom that surpasses that of even some of the most popular AAA games on the market. Cut to Halloween of 2018, and Toby would follow the massive success with the hype-absorbing release of Deltarune Chapter 1, a prospective demo for a sister series slash alternate universe story to Undertale's universe. And if you don't already know what to expect, it blew up as well, garnering massive success even in just being a potential seventh of the full game that Toby wants to eventually make. Very recently, in the past month, Chapter 2 has made its way to our computer and console screens, and its success has been predictably explosive. I could talk about the many, many reasons why Toby Fox's games are as successful and lovable as they are, but first of all, they've just been so exhaustively covered by others already, and second, Undertale in particular is something of an extremely special case to me, of media that has become extremely personally important to my life, and talking about it in an encompassing way is much outside the ambition of scope of what I can feasibly do today. What I will say, however, is that when these games are played the way that you are highly suggested to, they are fun, friendly, vibrant experiences with pockets of shock to enhance the overall heights of positive emotion, character bonding, irreverent gags, and loving tenderness that you'll experience throughout their runtimes. But what happens when you play it like a real jerk? This warm veneer fades away, revealing underneath one of the softest games around, a real set of horrific, pointed teeth. The cold it provokes is one of the loneliest and most convincingly frightening I've ever experienced in a piece of media, and it's in a game that looks like this. So that's exactly what I want to talk about today. How the worst routes of Undertale and Deltarune take such a mastery over the Saturn and can equally turn around and put you in a stranglehold of fear, if you go looking for it. This is how Toby Fox creates nightmares. Oh, and uh, spoilers for all routes of Undertale and Deltarune up to chapter two. Okay, okay. <laughs> Undertale, for those of you living under a rock, is a game with, ultimately, a pretty simple premise. It's a JRPG-style adventure in the same vein as something like Mother 2 or 3. You follow a pretty simplistic path through a kooky and crazy world filled to the brim with memorable, lovable characters, hilarious and quirky events, bizarre enemies, and a kick-ass soundtrack. The around six-hour adventure will, however, take you through slightly different versions of the path depending on your decisions. Yes, Undertale is one of the most truly reactive games I've ever played when it comes to branching choices. Because this is no Clementine will remember that tier pathway system, this looks out for everything you do, to a pretty meta extent. Reload your save because you regret killing somebody, you're gonna get called out on that. Reload before you met a character, thus reliving their introduction twice, they get deja vu. Rekill the same boss over and over, game pegs you as quote, kind of a freak. And this choice system relates most to the combat of Undertale, wherein you were heavily incentivized to go through the game without killing anybody, sparing them essentially through back and forth puzzle segments through the act menu commands, trying to see what will pass them and end the fighting, meanwhile dodging their projectiles on low defense stats during these little Toho Jr.-esque bullet hell screens that take place on each monster's attack phase. If you manage the sometimes tall task of experiencing the game without getting blood on your hands, you get arguably the most out of the experience, and are rewarded with the full extent of the story and the happiest ending, and of course, the time you spend with these characters. Indeed, the success of Undertale largely runs on whether or not you can actually attach yourself to these guys and if you don't, then I can understand why it may fall flat for some. But I adored all of them, so you can see why it gripped me. Taking the path of least resistance and failing not to start killing things is not, in general, what nets you the full road to the dark side, though. Instead, this basically earns you one of the game's many neutral endings, which, depending on how many or what specific people you kill, can get you anything from a light talking to with a bittersweet downer ending, to a truly bleak ending with Sans telling you to go to hell. 
This means that the true path of no mercy is not one that somebody stumbles into on accident, as it is characterized not just by killing every monster you encounter, but never moving on from an area until you stop encountering them. Some people call this path by a different name, and for a few reasons, not the least of which being this video's ad status, I'm not going to do that, so moving right along. The path of a merciless player in Undertale is not one to be easily crossed. There is a high likelihood while playing the game that you will have at least played the pacifist run before before ever attempting something like this. And it's a sobering realization once booting the game up again after that when you're faced with the literal main antagonist of the game declaring that you, the player, are the last obstacle in the way of these characters truly moving on with their happy ending. Your role is done. You could close the game and walk away, leave them to it. Or, for your own selfish curiosity, just like Flowey did when he had the power to save and reload, a power he so eloquently notes he lost when you showed up, you can rip everything away from them, reset everything to zero, start all over again, and distance yourself from the characters you've come to know and love, viewing them as just variables and numbers, wanting to see how they'll react, how they'll change, as everything crumbles around them. With great reluctance, you hover over the reset button anyway though, because that searing curiosity inside is just too much to stomach without knowing. You have to know, and so you do it. Or you just don't care at all, which, if so, what's wrong with you? And from there, the game starts as normal. At the beginning, the changes won't be obvious because things haven't quite started changing yet. In fact, this path has several points that you could just stop cold turkey along the way. You'll still probably get one miserable neutral ending, but it could be counted as neutral nonetheless. Farming for experience in clearing areas, though, just continues to lock you in further and further. The once vibrant and cartoony cast of random monsters to fight becoming replaced, notably, by a screen declaring with cold mechanical silence and eerie ambiance that nobody came. This is the first indication during a run like this that something is deeply wrong. The world of Undertale is such a refuge of light and joy for the most part that robbing a sense of warmth of inhabitants from it starts to make it feel truly empty. I said earlier that Undertale is a game that's relatively linear and simple in its actual path forward, but the experiences you make with the characters and the world around you is what makes that somewhat simple journey very personal and emotionally significant. The time you spend during this journey will inevitably be made up of the many encounters you face and the many creative, kind ways you're able to turn a battle into a slightly harrowing goof-off with pals. In a sense, these sets of scenes, lines of dialogue, become a big blanket around you during your first playthrough, like a big happy communal experience that really sucks you into the underground and makes you feel welcome. By contrast, these spaces never seemed emptier when you start killing, and that's not just because they've got less people in them. These spaces, as simple as they can often be, are so much more evidently straightforward when you stop seeing a need to stop and smell the flowers, as it were. These spaces are not conducive to plowing through at breakneck pace. This is a collection of snapshots, experiences that you should be having. And here you are trampling all over them, depriving yourself of them, and ensuring you'll never be able to have them. Not by yourself. Not when you've killed all of the people who could give them to you, one by one. All of the friendly faces who make up the bulk of your quirky adventures the first go around begin to fade. Once brain-teasing puzzles and cute environmental hazards get swept away by the tide. The game adjusting to your prioritization of violence. Shopkeeps abandon their posts in a hurry, notes begging you not to hurt their families. Encounters thin out as if the dull wait for you is a desperate bid by the monsters to try to bore you out of slaughtering them. Maybe, just maybe, if they can hide from you for long enough, you won't wipe them out. But hour by hour passes, and encounter after encounter thins away at the now visible tally of monsters you've yet to convert to dusty corpses on the save markers. And soon enough, each area becomes another empty wasteland, devoid of the charm and love it was brimming with when you first arrived. And if you brought them to this point, you'll never know what it's like to see them that way again. This all culminates in one of, easily, the most convincing stopgaps meant to convince you out of doing what you're doing in the early game. Talking to Sans after the bridge encounter with Papyrus will earn you this dialogue. Say, I've been thinking. 
Seems like you're gonna fight my brother pretty soon. Here's some friendly advice. If you keep going the way you are now, you're gonna have a bad time. When I say Undertale is a game about choice, I don't just mean the arbitrary option to choose, but rather the entire scope of a choice. The choice itself, the implications, the result, the fallout, the consequences. Everything anyone does will have some kind of relevance to the world around them, after all. It may not be a bad choice, and your choice may not even be everyone's business, ultimately. The choices you make in a video game by that metric seem barely above consideration, since when should the lives of the virtual influence the way you see reality? Well, for them, it is reality. And no, I'm not here to argue that the Undertale characters are well and truly alive. That would be insane. And if they were, clearly I'd already be holding hands with Muffet, and that hasn't happened yet, so... <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is, the world of Undertale functions in response to consequence the way ours does, because the characters living in it know nothing else. They don't treat their lives like a game, they just treat them like their lives. And if you come along and disrupt, destroy their lives, they're going to react the way you'd expect them to broken, battered, scared, and truly repulsed by you. Every line of dialogue is made to emphasize what a threat you're becoming with each gradual step down this path. Sans not even acknowledging you as human, Papyrus realizing he doesn't need your company, Undyne literally taking the stand as the story's true hero to stop you once and for all, shonen anime protagonist style as her eyes shine like a fountain of light and she gets a badass transformation outfit change. But even that isn't enough. After all, she's just a character in a game, and you're outside of it. She can kill you as many times as she wants but you can always go back and erase her progress with another attempt. Attempt after attempt, you can learn to read her, and when she'll never be able to read you. And inch by inch, you'll close in on what seems like a mountain's gap of skill as it becomes more and more negligible. Until eventually, you kill her once. And that's unfortunately all it takes. Another friend buried, another memory ruined, perverted, gone. Another area is haunted by the hallowed tombs and empty walls that once housed so much life. The life you put a silence to. And now there's no joy, no fanfare, no incident. You are alone. And you have nobody but yourself to blame. If you were as profoundly attached to the characters of Undertale as I was by this point, you'd start to realize you just may have started to scare yourself. It's an intoxicatingly frightful thought, isn't it? To imagine yourself capable of such emotionally lofty things that crush you so noticeably. Is consequence all it took for what seems like a routine grinding session in an RPG to become so heartbreaking, horrifying? How many times have you done this very type of thing without blinking, without even giving it a second thought? I don't think Undertale is necessarily trying to say that video game violence is inherently bad. I actually think that people who take that away from it are doing it something of a disservice by assuming its intentions so shallow. But it certainly wants you to think about violence and how oft desensitized we can be to it under certain contexts. And it sets out to provide those contexts clearly and concisely while contrasting them with elements we don't often get thrown into the mix. Elements like, say, this heavy burden of conscience that plagues us every moment of this miserable, murderous run. It has no interest in standing aside and letting us walk neck deep into hell without a word. Overbearing or not, it wants us to know exactly where we're treading. And it wants to know if we're truly cold-hearted enough to hear that and keep going anyway. By the time you've reached Hotland, it becomes more apparent than ever that these spaces aren't meant to be empty. The well-timed interruptions of fun gag calls with Alfies and the absurdist comedy of your many encounters with Metaton are swept into quiet, uncomfortable obscurity. Along the way, your alert to encounters arriving has changed from a simple exclamation point to an eerie smile. These monsters want nothing more than to avoid you at all costs, and yet your death march continues. 
The once peppy and perfectly fitting music that once characterized these places with a fresh, unique atmosphere has now faded into slow, droning soundscapes indicative of a death march. You're not bringing any kind of joy along with you. Even Metaton falls easily to you, and his battle in the original playthrough is one of the most delightfully eclectic in the run. The castle, by comparison, feels like a final nail in the coffin, as you traipse your way across the empty halls of New Home. Flowey, of all people, begins to vibe with you, detailing exactly how he felt when he started killing in a way that's clearly meant to reflect your state of mind going into this, as if you hadn't already been called out enough by this point. At first, I used my powers for good. I became friends with everyone. I solved all their problems flawlessly. Their companionship was amusing, for a while. As time repeated, people proved themselves predictable. What would this person say if I gave them this? What would they do if I said this to them? Once you know the answer, that's it. That's all they are. It all started because I was curious. Curious what would happen if I killed them. I don't like this, I told myself. I'm just doing this because I have to know what happens. <laughs> what an excuse. You of all people must know how liberating it is to act this way. At least we're better than those sickos that stand around and watch it happen. Those pathetic people that want to see it, but are too weak to do it for themselves. I bet someone like that is watching right now, aren't they? Nowadays, even that's grown tiring. You understand. I've done everything this world has to offer. I've read every book, I've burned every book. I've won every game, I've lost every game. I've appeased everyone, I've killed everyone. Sets of numbers, lines of dialogue. I've seen them all. But what really sets this scene apart, aside from the fact that this dialogue really is meant to put you firmly in Flowey's shoes and make you understand that you've made the same descent he did, is what comes afterward. Realizing that people of your ilk wouldn't hesitate to kill the other if they got in each other's way, the usually confident, coy, and cruel Flower starts to shake. The music becomes a low, looming drone mechanical sounds matching the pace of ill-intended footsteps marching towards its target. Flowey relents, no longer able to hide from his fear, as slowly but surely his facade of self-assured cruelty melts away under the pressure of fear. That's right, buddy. Flowey is scared of you. And by this point, there's a good chance that you are too. But it's a sunk cost, right? You're much too deep at this point to step out of the driver's seat, wipe your hands clean, and say this was a bad idea. You've killed way too many people to think that way. When you arrive at the judgment hall, you're pretty sure you know how Sans is gonna take all of the- Oh, Jesus! Oh, God! What the hell is happening? Yeah, everybody knows by now what Sans is like to fight. I'm not actually gonna spend much time talking about his fight, just because I don't find much overall about it particularly frightening, at least in the thick of it. Most of the fear comes from first exposure, and then as it winds down. It's hard not to be a little hyped, actually, when Megalovania begins to play, as it is obviously one of Toby Fox's most famous compositions for a very good reason. It just slaps. It's definitely hard not to feel the kind of gut-deep discomfort that comes with the text, you feel your sins crawling on your back, though. And Sans's desperation as he describes he can't afford to stand back and be as non-committal as he usually is, despite his despair in knowing that you're eventually going to just kill him, is legitimately heartbreaking in a way that really does make you feel the horrific weight of making a close friend and then horrifically betraying them in every way imaginable. When the fight comes to a close, your temptation to pump your fists and declare victory will most likely be short-lived. Blood pooling on him as he smiles, Sans can only say, 
one thing. So, guess that's it, huh? Just don't say I didn't warn you. Well, I'm going to Grillby's. Papyrus, do you want anything? And though it's a small detail, easy to miss for most, you've been killing for so long you will no doubt notice the telltale signs. The sound of the dust evaporating in the air as Sans dies off screen, and your level increasing from 19 to 20. It's a hollow victory. It means little else than bragging rights for defeating a hard enemy. But he was only so difficult because he was so desperate to get you to stop. And you still didn't listen. You continue into the next room, only to cut Asgore down within seconds. Flowey bursting onto the scene to deliver an overkill of a final blow, just because he's so terrified of what you've become that he's losing all face in a last plea for his own miserable life before you also cut him down, ruthlessly, over and over until there's not even a scrap of him left. And oh boy, okay, this bit's going to be controversial. Hey, you know this screen, the one with the smiling kid? I know you guys love to draw Kara here and pin all the blame for the murder run on them, but here's the thing, geniuses, this is you. You overwrote Frisk's opportunities. You killed their and your friends. You reduced this world to nothing. Why do you think this character is named after what would almost inevitably be your own name that you inputted at the start? You are the unseen hand guiding Frisk on their journey. When you play the game like a pacifist, you create no need for a repulsive reflection like this because it doesn't exist. When you play it like a monster, you get a fittingly monstrous face staring you back because that's what you've signaled to the game. You've flagged that this, leveling, gaining experience, and killing people to earn that, is what matters most to you. Not friendship, not puzzles, not bonding, not small intimate moments. This is what you've craved. This is what reflects you best. This is not just some separate character that you can shove all responsibility onto. Sure, Kara has some lore of their own, don't get me wrong, I know that. But there's also a reason why Toby would name them after you, right? Every choice in Undertale is very methodical, very deliberate. This, of course, also pertains to its characters. They're three-dimensional. Even villainous characters have nuances throughout Toby's narratives. They're not just embodiments of evil for evil's sake. So why would this be any different? Why would the spirit of some random dead kid be pure evil if not to reflect clearly and sincerely to you, who they've likely been named after, the evil you've sincerely done. It's a hard pill to swallow, and I think that's why a lot of people stay deliberately obtuse about this point. But Undertale is a game that makes you accept responsibility, and if you've reached this screen, there's really no more escaping it now. After all, you've got to live with these choices you've made and all of their outcomes. It's why the game is so insistent on punishing you with a cursed save file for this. You can blame your own actions on this invisible Kara all you want, but the fact remains that you'll never escape them so long as you're unable to acknowledge that they are you. Right. You are a great partner. We'll be together forever. Won't we? So, uh, Deltarune, am I right? The pseudo-sequel slash AU alternate universe Smorgasbord recently released a second chapter, and up until its release, you'd be forgiven for thinking that there wasn't necessarily an equivalent to what we just talked about lurking within it. After all, the narrative emphasis of player choice not really mattering much is emphasized within it from the start, with your create a character screen leading to a complete scrapping of your product and being placed in charge of the player character Chris instead. 
Not only that, there are many early choices offered to you under the guise of branching answers that either have little narrative difference from one another or are outright ended before you get a chance to answer at all. This results in a first chapter that, at most, is possible to be an asshole in, but not really be a murderer within. After all, harming enemies enough leads them to fleeing encounters altogether. The same scale of violence as possible in the darkest paths of Undertale don't really seem accessible here. Until you get a hold of Noelle. Noelle Holiday is a cute little deer girl who is one of the central fixtures narratively of Chapter 2's story. At one point in the game, you're basically separated from Susie and Ralsei, the other two primary party members, and led through the city with Noelle in tow, basically trying to help her gain some level of confidence and also reconnect with Chris, who she hasn't been as close to in quite some time, despite their background as childhood friends. What you might not immediately discover as a pacifistic player is that Noelle's ice magic has the potential to freeze enemies solid. Freezing somebody solid, I'm sure you realize, is an effective way to kill somebody instantly. And since you're doing it indirectly through commanding Noel, and the enemies have no time to escape with their lives when they see things getting bad for them, this becomes an open path for slaughter for the sadistically inclined. And the game fully accounted for this this time around. The gradual and intensely discomforting tonal shift arising from this is similar in nature to the tone Undertale's No Mercy run takes. But it also takes a decidedly darker turn in one key area that I think makes a world of difference. The fact that you're not entirely alone. In Undertale, sure, the isolation of the whole thing made it especially eerie as you watched yourself transform into the monster everyone feared, that's true. But what makes the Snowgrave path, as it's come to be known, of Deltarune Chapter 2 so harrowing, however, is the fact that you can't actually go through with all of this by yourself, so you basically have to manipulate Noelle into doing it for you by proxy. She comes to depend on you for what she believes is an ability to press onward and become stronger, to abandon her passive nature and become self-sufficient, when really what she's doing is falling prey to your demands and being forced through fear to do monstrous things. Soon enough, the enemies you see in the overworld, a feature absent from Undertale, start hitting this point home even harder by running away from you instead of towards you for combat encounters. They're desperate not to get into that encounter because the popsicled corpses littering the city are already proof enough of what's waiting for them on the other side of it if they do. There's a device through this section used for puzzles where a laser stays activated unless you or Noelle stand on corresponding switches to let the other cross, and there's literally a moment deep into the slaughter where Noelle ponders in guilt whether she should step off the switch and let Chris get killed. It's dark stuff. And it culminates in an encounter with Birdly, the other additional fixture of this chapter from the Waking World cast. Birdly is... Okay, yeah, well, he's up his own butt, pretentious, annoying, and worst of all, a gamer. But he definitely doesn't deserve to be killed, and especially not in such a horrible way as the way you've been forcing Noelle to do up until this point. But if you go through with it, Birdly is apparently killed, or at least something happens to him to correspond with his outside self, because he's frozen solid, and he doesn't show back up for the remainder of the chapter after this. Noelle, who along with Birdly would have remained an integral part of the story even after this, just sadly disappears without a trace after this point, declaring that she feels awful. This is what I think really just hits harder than anything else in the Snowgrave Path, the fact that you're not only mowing down innocent lives with your own hands, but this time you're manipulating someone else into it, someone who will have blood on their hands, be complicit in your deeds, and who is an otherwise kind and caring person. Noelle didn't know what she was doing, but you knew what you were doing to her, and the fact that she could be made to feel so reliant on you to such a toxically dependent degree while simultaneously being terrified of you? Yeah, that's no joke. That's pretty much abuse. Snowgrave, the most immersive simulator for being an abuser on the market. No, but really, you get what I mean, right? About how somehow the isolation made it less harrowing last time? At least you were fully in control of your own actions and had no one else to answer to in Undertale's case. You knew that you were a monster and you had every intention of doing this yourself to appease yourself, so long as you weren't in denial about it. 
In Deltarune, though, you're roping in a third party, and that's where it just becomes an even more sickly feeling. It literally makes my skin crawl, it's so nightmarish. There's just something so much more raw and horrible feeling about it, and I guess that speaks to the strength of Toby Fox's ability to instill emotion in people with his games, that this intense feeling of guilt is something he can still provoke even now, especially in a game which, in its primary, happier route, made me smile so much my jaw hurt. This emotional duality is present throughout Toby's games all the time, and I think that's extremely impressive, because I shuddered to think that a man could be so talented as to make me laugh, smile, and cry with such pure, unadulterated wonder and joy and emotion in the same games that have put more fear into me than even some dedicated horror games have been able to. God, that's not even to mention the excellent weaving together of some of these elements, like with either respective fight both in the hidden pacifist method or the end boss snowgrave method with Spamton Neo, who is simultaneously hilarious, terrifying, and host of one of the most kick-ass tracks in all of Chapter 2's soundtrack. Like, yeah, this is a banger, but oh my god, did he really just say that? Oh, and uh, hot take, I guess. I thought this was obvious, but Chris isn't evil either, guys. I know, it's so tempting to jump right back onto the child in the green shirt is inexplicably evil despite everything about Toby Fox's characterization and writing habits contradicting me on that, but hey, people will literally adjust to any kind of narratively incoherent explanation in the world if it takes uncomfortable personal responsibility off of their shoulders specifically, so I guess you guys are getting uncomfortable again. Before I go today, though, there is one last terrifying bit of these games I wanted to mention, and it's extremely iconic. It even comes from the pacifist run of Undertale, so it's likely most people will know exactly what I'm talking about. But I think it's prudent to touch on, because I think it's the perfect way to concisely wrap back around on what I've been getting at here in regards to Toby Fox's mastery of a sort of tonal duality. That moment of Undertale is the fight with Omega Flowey. For those of you who've lived under a rock, essentially the defining context of Omega Flowey is that you met Flowey all the way back at the beginning of the game and he was just some weird evil flower who tried to kill you and said some foreboding things. From that point on, he was mostly just something that would remain in the back of your head, practically unheard from since, with very few hints towards his presence sprinkled throughout. In remaining pacifistic, denying his declarations of the world being kill or be killed towards the game's opening moments, You've essentially been playing the pacifist run in direct defiance of his outlook, each tough encounter you clear being further proof that compassion and care, while sometimes the harder road to travel, is the one that is ultimately the most worth it. And in a final terrible encounter with the king of all monsters, Asgore, who truthfully has no personal desire but rather an obligation to fight you, you offer the poor man your trademark sense of mercy only to have that expectation of reconciliation obliterated as Flowey appears for the first time since the beginning of your run, killing Asgore while he's down, absorbing the human souls at his disposal, and becoming an abominable, eldritch creature of unspeakable mass, indescribable features, and a nightmarish cackle. Both the visual stylings and even manner of presentation in this fight are vastly different from what has come before this at any point in the game's combat so far. No matter the strange encounters you fought in Undertale, the unifying visual style of the UI was enough to keep everything feeling at least somewhat consistent and understandable, even when new elements were steadily introduced into the mix along the way. With Omega Flowey, this is not the case. Gone are your menu commands, gone are even turns to break the pace of bullet hell segments. Instead, you are fighting for your life against a torrent of miserably cheap attacks as Flowey laughs in your face, showers you with nigh unavoidable projectiles, and almost inevitably kills you over and over as strange deformed appendages sprout from his cactus-like arms, flies swarm you like blood-sucking locusts, warheads drop from the sky raining death on top of you, an anguished tortured face writhes in agony on the monitor above, and your only meager attempts at retaliation prove to have little to no effect on him for your trouble. It is an out-and-out out nightmare. It's a truly disorienting experience that takes all of your muscle memory, all of your visual adjustment, and throws it out the window. It takes 
full advantage of the psychology behind one of the most effective methods at evoking fear, which is establishing a visual style that a viewer or player of something can become extremely accustomed to over the course of their involvement with a work, and then suddenly striking them with something completely alien to that experience up until that point. This inevitably creates a sense of shock, instability, and unease, which is perfectly translated in a scenario like this into fear. The booming orchestral swell of pure dread that is the track Your Best Nightmare, which plays during this fight, is a perfect encapsulation of this. The cacophony of discordant melodies scoring what sounds like what it might feel like to quite literally be trapped in hell. But in a move that I think highlights Toby Fox's creative duality just as totally, this fight of course has more to offer than just that. During the fight, if you can manage to strap in and endure the gauntlet of misery thrown your way, you'll start to hit little interlude segments when you're tasked with avoiding specific hazards related to the human souls Flowey's exploiting. Endure these rounds long enough and they'll start to offer brief windows of assistance to heal you so that you can endure the next bare-knuckle beatdown you receive from the monster afterward. Constantly during this fight, there is a dynamic of being completely broken and nigh destroyed, but brought back from the brink at the very last second. Again and again, Flowey brings you to the near edge of death, his unrelenting cruelty staved off for only another minute by the kindness of others. Eventually, when you've passed all these gauntlets and hope seems so far away, the souls gather in a circle. They show you the love that you've shown everyone until this point all of them healing you simultaneously. The music changes. Gone is the frantic, hellish symphony of doom, and here is something soft that rises into something triumphant. Flowey's defense suddenly drops to zero, and his theme which had once characterized his cruel dominance over you has suddenly begun to swell into a hopeful anthem for your rise. His attacks slow, becoming more cluttered than ever to try to make up for what efficiency he lacks. Your attacks begin to hit harder and harder as the theme climbs. This piece, Finale, is one of my absolute favorite themes of all time in a video game. Scoring the journey you've made from rock bottom up through hell's flames and back to the starting line to fight for what's good and loving once again. And as horrifying as all this was, as borderline traumatic as some of the imagery that accompanied it seemed, it all caves under the weight of your light, exposed for the cynical, illusionary convenience that it always truly was under the surface. Flowey loses, and even still, after he's done, you offer him the mercy he mocked you for handing out before. He can't understand it, or maybe he just won't. But it's this simple principle that took you this far, and even now, when it's been tested to its very core, it's what you can hold on to, despite it all. Despite everything, it's still you. And I think that's what's really special about Toby's games. The fact that he can evoke such starkly negative emotions, but inject them with a sense of gravity and purpose that is not only able to coexist with his goofier, happier writing, but can oftentimes work in direct service of it, both in their contrast and in illustrating the very themes his games are meant to reflect in the first place. That isn't nearly all of what his games means to me, for the record. But I think in a month dedicated to talking about what scares us, this is a good place to start. For now. Oh, and by the way, Chris is non-binary. Click like to scare a transphobe today!